Welcome to flute Q&A number 12 with me, Jane Kavanagh. I'm a flute teacher and I love teaching people how to get faster progress through learning proper technique on the flute. Firstly, a big welcome to you if you joined the Flute Academy, which opened a few weeks ago. Everyone in, here, in, <laughs> everyone in here in the Flute Academy has been going so well. I've been watching everyone make little moments of progress throughout their first few days and their first few weeks in the Academy. So again, welcome. All right, we've got five questions today and they are from Nikki, Betty, Janice, Ronnie or Renee uh, and Jenny. So Nikki's question is, my flute teacher has changed her teaching conditions, price and location, and I've had to stop my lessons. I was preparing for my ABRSM grade five exam. How would you suggest I keep up momentum until I can find another teacher? Yes, I have really a really good suggestion for you. Now for anyone who just went, whoa, what was that acronym you just said? ABRSM, Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music. It's basically the, the British flute exam system, but it's also worldwide. So you can do ABRSM exams in Australia. And if you're in another country, you can probably do that as well. Uh, so Nikki, hands down the best thing you can do to prepare for your exam while you're waiting for a new teacher. And maybe you've already found a new teacher already since you wrote this question. Even if you have, this is still one of the best things that you could do. And it is to practice your pieces with accompaniment so with piano accompaniment when you do your exam you need to play with piano accompaniment and it's something that a lot of exam students neglect um, for a couple of reasons sometimes they don't know how important it is to actually practice with piano and two sometimes they just don't have the availability of a piano player so I have three excellent suggestions for you so firstly if you're if you're sort of like sort of getting close to being ready to do your exam. So for example, if you know your pieces already, this is a perfect time to start rehearsing them with a piano player. So the first suggestion for you is find a real life piano accompanist and go and practice with them. Uh, definitely, definitely do that because you need to do that for your exam. So, and the earlier you start and the more practice you get, the better. Um, ideally you would keep practicing with this piano player a lot, maybe like once a week for, 10 weeks or something. Obviously the cost of that, it gets a bit prohibitive. So there are ways around, around this. Then the second uh, suggestion for you is to, well, firstly, go and see the real piano player and rehearse with them. And then instead of going lots and lots and lots and lots of times and forking out lots of money, um, find the accompaniment on YouTube if you can. So search for piano accompaniment, put in ABRSM, and your grade and it will come up with a list of things that people have put up there on YouTube and you might be able to uh, find your pieces there. Now rehearsing with accompaniment on YouTube isn't as good as the real thing because the job of an accompanist is to follow you. <laughs> what, what, a recording, what a recording does is not have any idea that you're there and there's no way that a recording can follow you. So you have to follow the recording. So it's really good to do, that is play with the recording of an accompaniment part. It's really good for you, but it's not good to rely on, which is why I suggested going and seeing the real piano player first. So you need to get the feeling of you being the performer and the accompanist following you. A recording won't give you that, but it will give you the familiarity of what the piano, pl piano part sounds like, which is amazing like w totally worth doing. Now the third option, if you can't find it on um, YouTube, or actually go back to the second option. When you're looking for this on YouTube, also go and have a look on Tom Play. If you don't know Tom Play, I've just learned about it in the last few weeks. It's incredible. It has heaps of pieces for flute and you play along with accompaniment. In some cases it's an orchestra, in some cases it's a piano, and in some cases it's a different ensemble. Um, have a look if your piece is on there because that can really, uh, really, really help you in the same way that a YouTube recording will help you. The difference is that Tom play, um, you can play along with the flute player as well, but same thing. It will never follow you. So the real, the real piano player is always the best option. The third option 
If you can't find your pieces on YouTube or Tomplay, see if you can get your accompanist to record them for you. And so this is a one-off cost, and then you can use them a lot to become familiar with your accompaniment. So there you go. Real life piano player is the best option, hands down, and definitely do it as much as you can. And then the second best thing, which is also good for familiarity, is playing along with recording. So there you go. All right, number two question comes from Betty. Are you going to cover double tonguing in the Flute Academy? Betty, you are in luck. It's This is coincidence that this question has come up now. I know you entered it a few weeks ago, but I'm answering these uh, questions for the Flute Q&As in order that I get received. And this came up now. The November topic for the technique workshop inside the Flute Academy is double tonguing. So it teaches you how to double tongue and then how to speed up your double, double tonguing to get it really fast. Um, so the, basically the, in the technique workshop, there are four stages of learning double tonguing and then coordinating yourself when you're double tonguing and then speeding it up so that it's really fast, which is what double tonguing is really useful for. Actually, I'll tell you the four stages in a second, but I'll just demonstrate so that I'm so that this video has you know, flute playing in it, not just me talking. <laughs> double tonguing uh, is basically used when you can't single tongue fast enough. Single tonguing, for anyone who doesn't know, is da, 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 da. So that's just normal tonguing. By the way, you can say ta or da, same thing, doesn't matter. Double tonguing is when you can't da, 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 da fast enough on the flute that you can switch to da, ga, da, ga. So da, ga, da, ga, da, ga, da, ga, da, ga, da, ga, da, and you can do that faster than single tongue tonguing. Occasionally you, I meet a flute player or a flute student who has such fast single tonguing that they don't even need to learn to double tongue because their single tonguing is so fast. For 99% of us, and this is normal, it's not, um, it's not a reflection on your ability, double tonguing is perfect to be able to play fast passages when you can't single tongue fast enough. So an example is if you have a piece like something like this. Oh, I really should have practiced this first. Oh, good. I played the right notes. So that's from William Tell. And you can see there's da-ga-da, da 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 In there, I did bursts of double tonguing. Another example is, um, so instead of short bursts, is when you have a really long passage uh, in, for example, Midsummer Night's Dream. The skirts are from Midsummer Night's Dream. Gosh. Let's see if I can remember this and play it without having played it for a while. <laughs> Look, that was a little bit messy, but in the spirit of these flute Q&As, that's what you get. <laughs> you get what you get. <laughs> so I could practice that and get it much clearer. But that was the idea of how it's a long passage of da ga da ga da ga da ga da ga da ga da Okay, so the four stages of learning double tonguing, which is what the lesson in the Technique Workshop of November is in the Academy. First step, you learn clarity and then of clarity of your individual dirt and gurt. And then second step is you learn to coordinate them, not only going back and forth with da ga da ga da ga da ga da but coordinating with your fingers as well so that they match up. The third stage is speed, so getting your da ga da ga da to be fast. And then the fourth stage is endurance, and it's getting your fast da ga da ga da ga da ga and be able to play long, long, long passages and not have your tongue feel like it's going to fall off. <laughs> so the short answer, Betty, to your question is yes, it is definitely covered in the Flute Academy. Now, by the way, when I say it's the November Technique Workshop, the um, the Technique Workshops, the new one each month in the Flute Academy, you get to view each one for a year. So if you're wanting to join the Flute Academy, but you're like, you know what, this month I'm traveling the world for a month, I want to join in December you can still see the double tonguing one. So it'll be there for a year until November in 2022 because it's 2021 now. Okay, the next question comes from Janice or Janice. My hands, air and mouth all relax or tense up together even when they don't have to. How can I get them to be more independent of one another? Thanks. That's a really good question, Janice, because... Um, you said something really key in your question. You said they all tense up together and you want them to be independent. I'm actually going to suggest to you, I suspect, that uh, it is one thing 
causing the tension in all of those parts that you mentioned. I'm going to su I suspect that there's one part of your body that is tensing up and it's causing all of those things to tense up all at once. So I feel, I suspect that you won't have to independently relax those three things, especially if you've tried and they keep working together. I suspect that you need to try and find the root cause of what's causing all those three bits of tension. Now, um, speaking of the Flute Academy, there's a whole module in the Flute Academy. Actually, in the, in, the, in the Flute Academy, there's a course that you get called the 45-Day Flute Transformation. In that 45-day course, there's a module called Tension and Pain. In that module, we go systematically through your body and we work out where this tension is coming from. And we systematically go through, identify the tension and then relax it and then see what it does to other parts of your body. It's a very comprehensive way of working out where tension in your body is coming from. Um, a clue for you is see if your, see if your shoulders in, are involved. Like just see if you can get a sense of um, if maybe your shoulders are, are the key because for a lot of people that's where the tension is coming from but they don't realize. Like you can't, you, you can't even feel that it's there. I call it sneaky shoulder tension. You can't even feel that it's there. So, I mean you may not be able to identify it by yourself, but see how you go. Something might stand out to you. I mean, you might get a sore neck when you play and you're like, hmm, something's going on up there. Okay, the next question comes from, it's either Renee or Ronnie. So I'm sorry if I get that wrong. What is the best way to play with metronome? I find it hard to use and find that I often block it out, especially when playing a new song. It makes me nervous to use this and I find that I make more mistakes by playing wrong notes. So I'm going to call you Renee. Okay. <laughs> I hope I've got that. Renee, Ronnie. The, the um, hands down, don't learn a piece with metronome. So there are two things that I use a metronome for when I practice. And neither of them are for learning a piece, which I'll elaborate on in a second. So the two things that I use a metronome for... Uh, when you can already play a piece and you're wondering whether you're slowing down or speeding up, you know how you can play a piece, you can play all the rhythms right, but um, if you were to play with a piano or with an orchestra or with an ensemble band, you don't want to be the person that's speeding up. You don't want to be the person that's lagging. So you can use a metronome to simulate it being the ensemble and keeping you in time. Uh, actually not keeping you in time it can be it can simulate the ensemble to give you an idea of whether you're speeding up or slowing down and you'll be like and then you can on your music you can go okay don't speed up here and you can just be aware that when you're playing with a group not to speed up there because it'll feel like you're right and that everyone else is slowing down but a metronome gives you that sense of reality so the real beat the speed of the beat um, consistency of the speed of the beat. <laughs> and the second reason that I use a metronome is to deliberately push something faster. So you know how I was talking about double tonguing before? If I'm learning double tonguing, um, doing double tonguing exercises, I will do these exercises and I feel like I'm right on the edge of how fast I can go. So I'll do, that, do it with metronome and then I'll just put the metronome up one number, like up one click and then do it again and it just do the exercise, the double tonguing exercise again, and it just pushes you just a little bit, um, just a little bit faster. And it pushes you in a way that you wouldn't be able to necessarily be able to push by yourself. I, I think of it like if you're running a race, like let's say you're doing a whatever, running race. <laughs> you can tell how sporty I am. I call them running races. <laughs> um, and you have, you can sense someone on your shoulder behind you. They will push you. Uh, definitely someone will be able to run a faster speed if they've got someone just behind them that they're aware of just pushing them that little bit that they wouldn't be able to do by themselves that little bit faster so that's what a metronome can do and it's also the same for finger speed so if you're practicing scales and they're, and they're fast but you want to get them faster do it with a metronome put it up a click do it with a metronome put it up a click and it'll just push you that little bit faster now when you said that you tune out the metronome or you, what were your words? You block it out. That is key 
for saying that you should not have a metronome on because if you're blocking it out, your brain is full. You're, you've got too much coming in. You've got too much to think about, too much stimulation. If you're blocking out, turn it off a million percent and see if you can loan the piece without the metronome. Now, um, I don't use a metronome and I don't ever recommend using a metronome for learning to play in time, as in learning to play the right rhythm. So learning to play the right rhythm is something that you learn without a metronome. You don't need a metronome to learn the right rhythm. The reason for that is you have an internal sense of rhythm, natural, an internal sense of beat. And so what you want to, um, what you want to cultivate in you is an awareness of this internal sense of beat. So for example, this is the beat and this is what a metronome does. But this is not what you need a metronome for. If you're learning to play a piece and you've got rhythms that you need to learn, make sure that you can feel this beat in your body. The reason why I say that you have an internal sense of beat, even if you're, if you're thinking, ah, oh, but I can't play in time. When you walk down the street, you have a reg that is a regular, uh, regular beat, which is like a metronome. So you have this sense in you. Your heart also beats. And it keeps, obviously, you know, it speeds up when you're exercising and so on. But it's, it's, a re, it's a, generally speaking, unless something's going wrong, a regular beat in your body. So your body has an innate sense, whether you know it or not, of what a regular beat is. You can imagine a second, you can look at a clock and you can, you could predict what that second hand is going to do. You've got this, uh, this innate sense of beat. So you don't need a metronome to learn to play in time. What you might find that you need is you need to learn how to read rhythms. So if you're having trouble with um, playing rhythms in time and knowing how long to play notes for, uh, it's not the metronome that will help you. It is learning how to read and feel rhythms. So work on that with your teacher, if you have a teacher, and that will, re that will really help you. I'll just check if there's anything else. Um, Oh yes, you said it makes me nervous to use and I find that I'm making mistakes by playing wrong notes. That's another key, key sign to turn off your metronome and learn the piece first, learn it slower. If you're playing, excuse me, if you're playing wrong notes, you're doing it too fast. The metronome is just giving you anxiety of trying to keep up with something when you, what you really need to be doing is slowing it down so that you can give your brain the space to be able to work out the right notes comfortably without stressing you out. Okay. And the last question today comes from Jenny. Jenny says my daughter is eight and has been playing the flute for about a year with most of her lessons on zoom calls. She has had a problem with her cheeks until she watched your videos. Do you have anything appropriate for her? Firstly, that is so awesome that she uh, fixed her cheeks when she watched my videos. That's awesome. So the flute Academy that I mentioned is for adults but not adults in the sense of there being <laughs> adult content. So it's family friendly. So it's more adults in that I'm, I'm talking like this. So I'm doing this Q and a to adults. If your daughter gets anything out of these Q and A's, she will get a lot out of the flute Academy. The first step for her, I suggest is doing the free mini course to improve her tone. <clears throat> it improves her embouchure. Which and the cheeks are part of the embouchure. I know she's fixed her cheeks already, but if she had problems here, she probably had problems here as well. So go to www.flute.school/free. I'll put a link under your question here for you, and and get her to do the free mini course if she hasn't already. If she's already done it, do it again, because it's. I mean, it's only three days. It's only three videos, and it's so fundamental to playing the flute well that it'll help her even if she's done it before. Actually, that goes for anyone watching this video, if you've done the free mini course, go and do it again, because it's so, so helpful second time round and third time round. It's not something that you just, I mean, you get a lot out of it the first go. I was going to say, it's not something that you just do once and go fixed. You do it, you do it once and go, Oh my God, what a breakthrough. You do it again, a few weeks, few months, even a year later. And you go, you know what? I just picked up something new that I did, that my brain was too full to get the first time. So you get something out of it second time as well. Now, Jenny, the content in the Flute Academy, it's family friendly. So I don't swear. I don't say anything that is inappropriate for eight year olds. The only thing that I would say is I did a video on YouTube um, 
very early on. So I think it was, it was 2016 that I did a video and I talked about the crappy way of playing high notes. And I feel so bad about that because it's not the crappy way. It, I sh I was new to making videos and I hadn't really found my way of explaining things in videos. Um, so if you want her to avoid me saying that she plays high notes the crappy way versus the pro way, and then avoid that video. Everything else is um, is family friendly. So uh, I mean, you could you could investigate the Flute Academy and see see whether you think that it's right for her. I speak to adults, but you know. I love talking to kids as well. And I actually talk to kids in the same way that I talk to adults, just with less intellectual content, with less descriptions. Um, and I keep it much, uh, when I, when I, if I was to teach kids, well, I teach kids in real life, but it, when I teach kids in real life, it's much more one tiny concept, give them a chance to practice. And then that's it. For an adult, I'd probably do more than that because you're, you're capable of, taking in more information and more like adults are hungry for more information. Um, so I still keep it simple for adults, but adults are hungry for an explanation. That's what I should have said. Adults are hungry for an explanation. Kids aren't. Kids just want to know how to do it and then practice it. Adults want to know how to do it, practice it, and then they want to know why. So that's the difference in the way I teach. So if that might suit your daughter, then go for it. So that's it. They are the... I'll just check I got everything. Yes, they are the questions for this flute Q&A. Hope they helped you. See you later.